So the important stuff that I really want everyone to be able to recall right away is uh, alloying um, uh, comp uh, alloy, uh, common alloying elements, the alpha stabilizers, um, oxygen and aluminum, and nitrogen and carbon, right? Remember, oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon are interstitial. Aluminum is going to be substitutional. The beta stabilizers, vanadium, molybdenum, niobium, silicon, iron, and that uh, neutral elements, uh, uh, tin and zirconium, both of which are HCP. Zirconium is also a group four element like titanium, so chemically very much the same. Hafnium is also going to be a neutral element, but not used very much because it's so damn expensive. Um, right. Uh, pure alpha element, pure alpha alloys, primarily for corrosion resistance, particularly high temperature corrosion. And if we look at the strength curves here, they follow the trends that we expect to see for solid solution and interstitial strength and uh, um, uh, metals. So basically, uh, if we go into the alpha uh, plus beta alloys, we're going to try and develop heat treatments that primarily exploit the beta to beta plus alpha transformation. And the other phase transformations of interest for us are going to be the Martensitic phases, the beta to omega, which is hexagonal non-closed packed, and the beta to beta one and beta two, which are both BCC structures, but uh, different compositions and different lattice parameters. All right. So we talked at the end of class last time about beta processing, which is where we take our alloy up above the the transis, we completely solutionize in the beta field, then we quench down, and as we, as we cool down from the solutionizing heat treatment, we nucleate alpha on the grain boundaries, and we get Vidman statin labs that come in, right? And the Vidman, the mechanics and the transformation of that Vidman statin is, is completely analogous to steel. So all of the same physical metallurgy that we focused on there uh, applies here as well. So you're going to have to perhaps recall a little bit of that, right? When we, right, potentially for exams. Um, then we heat back up into the two phase region, right? To give an alpha plus beta anneal or sometimes called a alpha plus beta uh, hold, right? That lets some of the Vidman statin uh, dissolve. We get nucleation of alpha ribs through the, uh, through the rest of the structure and those alpha ribs thicken. As we cool down, back down to room temperature, these plates thicken and we, uh, right, we get thickening of the alpha ribs. Then we go up to a lower temperature well within the uh, alpha plus beta two phase region for a stabilization heat treatment. And that is where secondary alpha begins to form. And uh, well, secondary ribs, secondary alpha begins to form on the cool down from here. They, they develop fully during the stabilization heat treatment. Right, and then uh, this is a resulting structure, right? This is uh, very much a colony microstructure, which indicates that the cooling rate was, uh, was fairly slow, right? And our alpha here is going to nucleate at the prior beta grain boundaries, right? And then we're, we're going to nucleate and grow these alpha lads into the grain from the, from the grain boundary regions. If we speed it up, cool, cool faster, we get a basket weave structure where instead of 
regions of one crystallographic variant, we get interspersed variants, right? This is a higher nucleation rate of alpha. The nucleation is not just from the grain boundaries, it's in intragranular nucleation of alpha, right? And this is going to happen at a higher cooling rate, right? The faster the cooling rate, the larger the undercooling where a lot of this is happening. Uh, a lot of where the nucleation happens. All right, the secondary alpha forms in between on quenching and then is fully developed during uh, stabilization. The actual nucleation and growth of the secondary, uh, secondary alpha is still a really sort of open area uh, of research. The other big processing uh, <coughs> route is alpha plus beta processing. And this is very similar. So we solutionize in the same way. We get the formation of the allotromorphic alpha on the prior beta grain boundaries in the same Vindman statin plates. But then instead of a alpha plus beta anneal, we give it alpha plus beta working. So we, we roll it or forge it in the uh, two phase region. And this results in the formation of equiaxed alpha or globular alpha uh, grains. And this mechanism is still not really understood, right? Right now, the people who uh, do a lot of research in titanium, like Professor Frazier, believe that it's uh, um, a globularization process. You have this shearing of the Vidman statin plates coupled with recrystallization, All right? But we still don't really know a fundamental mechanism of how these globular uh, alpha forms. Then uh, basically from that point, it progresses very much like the beta processing. We get transformation uh, of the remaining uh, beta phase, we get, uh, Vidman statin plates and the adjacent ribs, right? So we have a structure that consists of uh, um, globular alpha and then transformed beta grains, right? So the common features for the, the basic terminology here that we want to keep in, in mind is we've got a prior beta grain, right? And we can clearly see here, the outline of the grain boundary. This is got a, a coating of allotromorphic uh, alpha on it that formed during the initial uh, uh, cool down from the beta solution solutionization. Colony structure, basket weave structure. If we zoom in, we have our grain boundary alpha and then our, our labs. Yeah, there's Yes. Yeah. It's dip more difficult with uh, um, beta process because the globular alpha, right? But you can still see this is basically a, a transformed beta grain here, right? So you can you can still see it because the the grain boundary is a potent nucleation site for the alpha, right? So you're always going to nucleate easier on the alpha, I mean, on the grain boundary. The question is then at slow, slower cooling rates, you're going to grow into the grain uh, as Vidman statin plates, or if you cool fast enough, but not fast enough to form the Martin site phases, right? You'll get intra, intragranular nucleation and form a, more, a basket weave structure, right? So the difference between here and here can be just cooling rate, right? right? So this is sort of like the terminology that I would that we would expect uh, uh, to to be fluent in. Okay, so in the equilibrium phase diagrams, right? Notice we have this big region here. If we include metastable phases, we've got a whole bunch of other 
uh, transformation. We've got omega and beta plus omega and beta plus beta one. Right, so we've got other phase transformations that we are interested in, right? And our Martin Siddick regions here, either hexagonal or orthorhombic, omega phase is simple hexagonal, and the beta one phase is also BCs. Right, so be, make sure you know the major, the crystal structures of the, of the, the major phases, right? And this is just sort of a rundown of the, uh, trans, the, the transformations that we're interested in. All right, we've been talking about the beta to the beta plus alpha because of the, of those process, that processing, right? But this just sort of sh shows the steps a little bit. On first cooling, we start to develop grain boundary alpha precipitates, right? And then we get alpha labs that grow off. These are our Vinman statin uh, alpha. As we continue, as the reaction continues, right, our grain boundary alpha precipitates coarsen to form a continuous allotromorphic uh, alpha layer. Uh, or grain boundary alpha layer, right? And these are the structures uh, that result. Here's our grain boundary alpha layer. Here's our growth. There's a lot of subtleties here that we're not quite, that we're not going to get into, right? But if you think about what happens at this grain boundary, you've got 12 different variants of alpha, just like martensite, right? And we talked a lot about with bainite and martensite about accommodation of the strain associated with them. We have similar things that have to happen here, right? So there's variant selection that happens, right? We nucleate this, right? And we'll grow this in, but when it comes time for these lads to nucleate, they're gonna pick a variant that minimizes the energy with the neighbor, right? So these variants are not, perfectly random. Um, and in, in strain, elastic strain has a big role to play in which variants nucleate. Um, and in fact, my only paper on titanium is about that, is looking at the mechanics of uh, variant selection. Uh, okay, so we talked about Kurjimov sacks in steel. The important orientation relationship for titanium is this bur is the Burgers orientation relationship. Okay, so what was the key idea behind Kurjimov sacks? Right there, we were going from FCC to BCC or BCT, and what was lined up? BCC is not a close pack structure, but what what crystallographic directions were parallel in Kurjimov sacks? The, the close packed, the close packed directions, right? So, what do you think going from BCC to HCP? What are we going to keep lined up? What's that? Yeah, our close packed direction, right? And so, what direction in HCP is that going to be lined up with? Oh, I'll throw it up there. There's our. So our basal plane is going to be parallel to our 011 plane, right? And then in terms of directions, what direction is this in our HCP ladders? Right. So one one bar two o type direction, the close packed. All right. So this is our our Berger's orientation relationship. All right. We can look at this. We have six different O one one planes in beta that we can choose from to nucleate on. All right. And then we have two possible alignments of the one one bar two o type plane. Right, 
So that gives us a total of 12 different possible alpha orientations that can nucleate from a beta orientation and maintain this Burgers orientation relationship, right? So still a lot of variance, not as bad as Martin's site, right? How many did we have for Martin's site in steels, right? If you encourage them off Sachs orientation, we had 24 possible, possible variants, right? So, uh, but still 12 is, 12 is a lot to choose from. And so basically, right, this is just a, a projection of the uh, BCC and HCP uh, uh, unit cells, right? And then these are basically uh, the two variants that share a common uh, 110 pole. Right. Okay. So again, just like in uh, Vidman statin plates in uh, in steels, right? This is this is why we can go through this because we've already seen this. Right? There's a perfect analogy to the step ledge both in twins and martensite and Vindman-Statin, right, that we, that we saw before, right? Remember, if we're, this is our growth base, right? We're growing uh, this way, right? This is going to tend to be a general high angle boundary, but our long side face, we want to keep the, uh, um, Burger's orientation relationship, the low energy boundary. So that's going to have significantly less mobility. But we do know that our plates coarsen, right? In the same way that our Vidman statin plates coarsened in steel, right? So we basically we have this step ledge, right? Burger's orientation relationship, C dislocation, Burger's orientation relationship, C dislocation, right? and that we can grow this plate wider by moving this dislocation parallel, these dislocations moving parallel, right? <clears throat> and, right, this isn't uh, sort of just theoretical. You see this when you actually do the microscopy, right? This was done by professor, one of Professor Frazier's students a couple years ago, right? And here's the alpha beta. Right, and we see our step ledge faceted, faceted interface. Right, so we could grow our alpha. Right, by passing these, by moving these dislocations, or growing the, growing the ledge out. So the kinetics of this growth looks very much like the kinetics of the Vidman stack. Uh, plates. Okay, Martin site. Again, this is good. I don't have to do the, the physical metallurgy of it because we've seen it, we've seen it with the steels, right? It's the same uh, process, except now we have two different types of martensite that can form, right? So alpha prime, we also have laugh martensite, which is going to uh, dislocations, right? Or we're gonna have lenticular twin martensite, right? All right, and this is going from beta, if it's alpha prime, beta to hexagonal to HCP by uh, without a change in composition, All right? So it's a very fast, uh, mostly iso, or mostly athermal process, right? At lower solute content, lower amount of beta stabilizers, we see uh, slipped Martin site, right? Completely analogously to steel. The lower the carbon, the more likely we were to see uh, the required shear uh, from the phenomenological theory of Martin site take place by slip. At higher solute contents in steel, it was higher carbon content. We moved into twin Martin sites, 
same thing here, same general um, principle. If we really increase our solute constant, we move to uh, alpha double prime, and some rare systems have alpha, alpha triple prime, which is a phase centered orthorhombic, right? Alpha double prime is also phase centered um, uh, uh, orthorhombic, right? The alpha prime is going to maintain the Burgers orientation relationship. Alpha double prime and alpha triple prime not being hexagonal or not or have a different relationship that isn't important for this. Uh, um, for this, it's just really more important to know that multiple Martin sites um, uh, exist. Right? These are just um, micrographs. Right? And so this is going to be when fast cooling. Right? A thermal. Right? We need to miss the nose of the diffusive TTT uh, curve, right? So again, completely analogous to what we learned from steels, right? It's, it's very much transferable, um, right? And remember this, the key thing to remember, this is a Martin site. So there's initially no compositional difference between the beta and the Martin site phase. There's no partitioning that's happening here, right? This is completely a sheer, right, military transformation. Well, so you have the the nose, right, and then which is alpha plus beta, but then it's complicated because we can get the other phases, the omega phase and intermetallics, right? Remember how how messy the um, the aluminum type, the titanium aluminum phase diagram got, right? The TTT diagram gets sort of the same the same way. But conceptually, yes, it's very much, it's very much the same. Generally, um, titanium is not processed in the same continuous cooling type way that steel is. So we don't, they're not, TTT and CCC diagrams are not drawn very much in the same way for titanium. Right, remember, we didn't really see them too much. We didn't really see it too much for aluminum, right? We didn't talk about GP zone so much on the TTT diagram. Um, right. Okay. Again, analogous to steel, we want to temper our Martin site, right? Because our Martin site is going to be brittle, right? So if we have alpha prime Martin site, right? So remember this. Uh, um, follows the Burgers orientation relationship. So if we're in isomorphous alloys, remember our phase diagram, right? The alpha plus beta field extends all the way down to room temperature, right? The, uh, the alpha, alpha prime is going to transform to the alpha of equilibrium composition as our, sol as our solutes partition, right? Alpha stabilizers are going to stay in. The alpha beta stabilizers are going to uh, transform out, and we're going to get beta that is going to form as a fine precipitate at the boundary between our alpha laths. All right. So it's going to look exactly what we, exactly how we expect. Right. And this increases the strength because this beta, fine beta precipitates at the at the interface give us uh, strength. Beta eutectoid alloys, the alpha is going to transform, the alpha prime is going to transform to, to alpha and a uh, um, intermetallic compound, right? And there's a large number of reactions that can form in which intermetallic compound forms is going to depend on the phase diagram, right? The alpha double prime Martin site is how this tempers is really um, alloy dependent, right? And so basically, you know that anything that's very highly alloy dependent and can't be generalized is not necessarily a good exam question, 
right? Because it requires memorization, which I don't like. Um, but if we have a martensite start that occurs at a, a high temperature, generally what happens is we nucleate a fine distribution of alpha within the alpha double prime matrix, which then begins to coarsen, right? And we get a, uh, um, the beginnings of a lamellar structure as we get uh, um, alpha that is going to nucleate and grow at the prior austenite, uh, pr not prior austenite, prior beta uh, brain boundaries. Right, see, I, 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 my, my mind makes this analogous to steel. If we have a martensite start for the alpha double prime that begins closer to room temperature, the alpha double prime uh, is going to basically transform to beta, and then that beta is going to decompose into alpha plus beta as per the, as per the others, right? And so it's basically just how high above the martensite start temperature we're, we're tempering. Right here, we're tempering at a low value, right? A, a low temperature relative to the Martin site start. Here, we're tempering at a higher temperature relative to the Martin site start. Okay. Now we get into the weird stuff omega phase. Okay. So we're going to need some beta stabilizers in there to form. Um, Omega. Omega is very important both from a uh, sometimes we want it, sometimes we don't, right? It plays havoc with the fatigue properties of some alloys, right? Right. Why would omega be um, be bad for fatigue? Right, or bad for fracture. What's its structure? Right. It's yeah, it's simple hexagonal, right? So I mean, it's not hexagonal close packed, right? Just layers, the basal layers stacked on top of each other, right? Uh, we don't necessarily know what the slip systems are, but we do know that they have very high uh, uh, pyral stresses, right? And if we have limit, if it takes a lot of strength, right? Right. We don't have much ductility in omega, right? But it leads to a um, so it causes alloys to be brittle. But if we can nucleate a fine dispersion of omega, and then uh, that can help us get a refined nucleation of the, the alpha phase, right? Omega can form either athermally by a fast quenching from the beta phase field, right? Again, sort of like bainite, right? Not fast enough for martensite, but not slow enough for alpha plus beta. Or it can be... Uh, formed isothermally by aging at low temperatures in the omega plus beta uh, metastable phase field, right? right? And so this is what you need to be careful of. So if you have an alloy that this will happen to at in service temperatures, that's potentially very damaging for your fatigue load of that, of that part. Right, not close packed um, structure, and the mechanism of it is uh, uh, quite complex. So, if we imagine a BCC unit cell, right, we can imagine this as being as the one 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 planes being stacked A B C, right. So the same stacking sequence as FCC, except the 111 planes are not close packed, right? So we still have this, this ABC stacking sequence in BCC, 
right? So you can see here, if we just look at one unit cell, this plane, this B plane doesn't actually have any atoms that lie in the unit cell, but if we stack a bunch of them together, we can see them. Um, and basically what happens is we get a collapse uh, of the B and C into one plane, leaving the A planes undistorted, right? So someone made a nice little visualization of this. Right, you watch that. You can see the B, the atoms on the B plane all sort of shift up. The atoms on the uh, C plane all shift down, right? And now we have this new plane B prime. So now our stacking in omega goes A, B prime, A, B prime. And being that these are simple hexagonal, right? You've got a close packed plane stacked on top of a close packed plane, right? But they're not offset. It's not going A, B, A, B, A, B. It's just going A, 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 right? So B prime here is equivalent to, to A. Where did the atoms on plane B go? Right, they just shift. Right, they collapse. They the atoms on plane B here will move up, in and as the atoms in plane C move down. So if you watch, if you watch B, oops, right, you see they shift up. The atoms in plane C shift down. Right. There's a, another, this is a, just a projection of the same thing. So this is, uh, right, our 001 BCC on this, right, so this, and the projection, our 110 crystallographic direction here, right, and they're colored by whether they lie above or below the 110 plane. And they're going to basically form a omega cell. These two atoms are going to shear like that. And that forms our omega unit cell. Right, and you can see that in the high angular uh, uh, dark field, right? We can see the, the beta go to the beta plus. Um, omega phases, and there's lots of examples sort of in the notes of this. So here we see a very, a very fine dispersion of these, of omega precipitates, right, which are uh, great for strengthening, right? So, um, so we gave this was this were formed by giving a beta solution treatment, right? Then, uh, isothermal hold at the uh, within the beta plus um, omega metastable uh, region, right? And we get a nice fine. <clears throat> Dis, uh, distribution. Okay. So this is, we're going to see this again with nickel, but the shape of these precipitates is strongly dependent on the lattice misfit between the uh, um, between the omega um, and beta uh, phases, right, which is going to be a strong a uh, strong parameter of the alloying content, right? Because we're going to partition as we nucleate these omega particles, right? So if we have a large misfit, we have cuboidal omega particles, smaller misfit omega. Why cuboidal for large misfits? Right. It seems counterintuitive at first, right? What, right? If we have a large misfit, what's our interfacial energy going to be? It's going to be higher. So why cuboidal? What's the shape that gives us the smallest amount of surface area per volume? 
spherical, right? So why not spherical particles? Why cuboidal? Well, I mean, the beta is cubic, right? But that doesn't mean we're going to get cube, cube particles. Right? Are all interfaces, are all the interfaces going to be equivalent with respect to their energy? Right? Are all, all grain boundaries, right? Even in FCC, are all FCC to FCC grain boundaries? equivalent with respect to their energy no right basically we get faceted growth because we get a low energy plane right a good orientation relationship that has low energy right and that plane we want to maintain that low energy right and so we can even though we have more surface area we have an overall lower energy structure because now we have eight faces that are all low energy versus a sphere where we have uh, a whole bunch of different interface types, right? But less of it, right? We have more high energy, more high energy areas, right? And we'll see that with nickel, right? Super alloys. And when super alloys have a higher misfit, we get a cuboidal gamma prime. Uh, Strengthening, right? Okay. And again, can you tell that? Uh, so, a lot of these notes um, I got from uh, Professor Fraser with uh, a bunch of additions, but can you tell that he, he does a lot of titanium microscopy? <laughs> right. It's all, I had, I had 500 slides all of electron micrographs of titanium. <laughs> Right. Then what's the beta plus omega, right? We now have this fine omega dispersion. We want to transform that to beta plus alpha, right? We want to keep the fine dispersion for strength, but we want alpha phase because of its uh, uh, properties and ductility. So we can, again, the same types of things that we talk about in aluminum, right? We go to omega phase, then we nucleate the alpha heterogeneously at the, uh, at the omega. Remember, just like GP zones are a metastable phase, the omega here is metastable, right? And so the omega, the omega precipitates act as a nucleation site, and here we see uh, um, an alpha precipitate takes a lot to stare at these and tease out what is what. Um, but then the resolution on there isn't the best, but we can see right here, this little blobby region here, a alpha precipitate growing at the omega beta. This is beta, this is omega. You can see this region where it's slightly shaded a little differently. If you go in there and you look at the at at atom projections, right, you can convince yourself that this is, is actually omega. Right here we see the same thing, beta, beta, here's our omega precipitate, and now we're growing this alpha. Uh, uh, precipitate nucleating at the beta omega. Uh, um, interface. Same sort of thing. Okay, beta to beta plus beta one. This is really analogous to GP zones, right? Because now we're just, we're not really going through a phase change so much. We're just clustering our solute. We have regions, clustered regions of, or cluster of high solute region. It's still uh, BCC. It's still a perfectly coherent interface. We just have a different lattice parameter. So we're going to get strengthening 
uh, due to the sheer, right, the, the elastic strain interacting with the dislocations in the same way that GP, that we did with GP zones, right? This is why I sort of started with aluminum and then spent so much time with that in steel because now it makes a lot of this really trivial to, uh, not trivial, but, right? You can, you just jump on this by, um, by analogy, right? So it's basically a phase separation in the beta phase, right? It's going to occur in near beta or beta alloys where we have a high concentration of, of beta stabilizers, right? Both BCC, right? And uh, forms very fine precipitates in the beta matrix, again, analogous to GP zones, right? This is 500, uh, nanometers, right? So you can see these are all like 10 or 20 nanometers of fine beta, uh, beta one um, precipitates happens at, at lower temperatures, right? In the beta matrix, again, if we go too high, we're going to dissolve these, right? Again, just like GP zones. If we go too high, we dissolve our GP zones. And then the beta plus beta one is going to uh, uh, transform to alpha plus beta because now the um, the beta one regions can act as nucleation sites uh, of uh, alpha, right? And then we end up with a fine homogeneous distribution of uh, of alpha. And here we see a, right, alpha on the beta one, right? And we can see alpha growing here. The alpha is the light phase. This is our prior beta grain boundary. So we can see alpha growing here. We can see alpha growing in our matrix, nucleating at, at the beta one. Okay. A couple other, Ordering reactions. Oh yeah. On the last slide. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that a uh, uh, not a precipitant free zone? It's the green boundary. This here? Yeah. <clears throat> um I have to check. I have to think about that. If it actually Right. I don't know offhand. I have to look that up. It's a very good question, though. Um, I don't know if that's pushing the analogy too far, right? Um, because we do see Bidman statin alpha nucleating at the grain boundary, right? But I, this region here, I'm fairly confident that I, I'm going to look it up, is that our alpha stabilizers have diffused to the grain boundary, right? And now we're growing out, but we basically have a precipitate three zone here because we're, because of the grain boundary acting as a sink for our um, alpha, uh, alpha stabilizers, right? I, I have to double check that, but I'm pretty, Pretty sure that's what we're that's what we're seeing here, right? So I'll come back with a full clarification on uh, Friday for you, All right? The last couple couple seconds, right? We have other things that can happen. Alpha can uh, um, order. Right, if we have a, a high alpha stabilizing content, right, we go, we form a um, ordered hexagonal, right, where we preferentially put aluminum atoms here to form Ti3Al, which forms a DO19 structure, right? So it's an ordered compound. It just means that the alpha, if we, we get 
our aluminum content goes above a certain threshold, they don't form randomly. They're not a random solid solution, right? They're on specific lattice sites um, and preferentially form. The intermetallics that are important are going to, um, oh, this, sorry, I was jumping one slide ahead. This shows the positions, right? So we basically have them on the AB plane, right? And they're at opposite angles, opposite to each other. And then the intermetallic that's important is the uh, titanium aluminide which is basically uh, BC or FCC with alternating layers of uh, titanium aluminum, titanium aluminum, right? And uh, that's our gamma phase. And that wraps up this. I'll post some questions to ponder and we'll have a quiz on this stuff one day.